Okay, welcome everybody. It's my very great pleasure to, to welcome you today to Michael Pozo's thesis event. Uh, we're all super excited for him. Uh, this is when I get to brag on him a little bit. Uh, Michael is special. He's fantastic. Um, you know, we have a lot of amazing people that come through here. And even at admissions time, we get to see a lot of amazing folders. And I remember the first time I met Michael, um, uh, he had been admitted to grad school. And there's this time where you meet the faculty for the first time, and the faculty sort of interview you, see if there's a, a chance for them to meet in your group. Um, it was pretty clear instantly that I wasn't interviewing Michael. Michael was interviewing me. Uh, and and I, over the course of the t our time together, it's always been clear that he's clocked a little faster than I am, and most people, honestly. And uh, uh, he's just brilliant to another level. And um, I think the work you'll see here that he'll present uh, today is some of the the deepest, uh, most impactful stuff we've, we've done in the lab, really. It's, it's fantastically good work, and I hope, I hope you get a piece of that to take away today. Uh, what you won't see as much is Michael's uh, hardware chops. He's going to talk more about the theoretic, theoretical and algorithmic uh, components of his work. Uh, before he came to MIT, he was, he was working a lot on hardware with Andreas, and, for instance, and uh, working on hydraulic robots at Vecna. Uh, he's <laughs> extremely good with hardware. Uh, and there was a time when we were working on the DARPA challenge where we asked, we called in Michael sort of as the cavalry to help us out. We were in a pinch, we needed his help. And uh, uh, he, for instance, came in and, and helped us cut uh, a piece of drywall out of the wall at the DARPA challenge at the robotics trials. Now, I think the CMU's triangle was a little straighter, honestly, but uh, <laughs> it probably didn't have this little thing hanging off. But they, admittedly, they had a much better robot. But, um, you know, Michael is extremely good at hardware, too, and really an all-around amazingly good roboticist. And you're going to see in his work uh, depth in terms of mechanics and sort of the mechanical engineering aspect of it. You're going to see depth in terms of the algorithms, and you're going to be, see depth in terms of the, the control theory. So uh, it's, a, it's fantastic. It's been fantastic having you in lab, Michael. We're going to miss you dearly, but I expect great things, and I'm super happy for uh, everything that's come out of this. Take it away. Ah, uh, thanks Russ, for that. Uh, it's going to be tough to, to follow up, but I'll do my best. Um, so the, uh, the title of my thesis is Optimization for uh, Control and Planning of Multi-Contact Dynamic Motion. And you know, as, as most people are probably aware, if you're following the field of robotics, you've seen just really incredible amount of growth in recent years from uh, academic and industrial sources. And there's a really broad expectation across the community, across the world, that this growth is going to continue at an accelerated pace, whether we're talking about agricultural robotics or home robotics, healthcare, manufacturing, you name it. Uh, but as, uh, as uh, researchers and as academics, you know, there's, a, there's a need for us to answer some of the really pressing, some of the really challenging questions to make this rosy outlook a reality uh, rather than just uh, another uh, bubble. So, you know, whether we're talking about your home, you know, butler robot, uh, your, you know, assembly manufacturing <coughs> robot, or your evil uh, world dominating robot, you know, I think contact is really fundamental to, to all these, these challenges that we want robots that are going to be able to go into the world and interact with that world in a safe and efficient, uh, controlled and effective manner. And uh, so as Russ mentioned, I got my start in, in robotics working at Vecna on the the bear robot shown here, and later spent some time on the DARPA robotics uh, challenge team. And one of my takeaways from this time was that there really are some of these fundamentally unsolved questions when it comes uh, comes to dealing with contact that our you know algorithms and our theory and our uh, our approaches tend to struggle uh, in these complex contact scenarios. So of course there has been a lot of really great work in this area. There's some nice uh, locomotion work, parkour, jumping robots. There's uh, you know manipulation work on, on large scales. Um, but just going back to that DARPA robotics challenge for a moment, it, it was in many ways you know, a measuring stick moment for the field. It was incredibly successful. There was a lot of uh, really impressive results demonstrated there. But there was also you know, a number of notable failures, and I'll save us all the blooper reel for today. Uh, you know, but what you saw was that these robots are incredibly brittle when it comes to unexpected contact, that just accidentally touching something uh, can lead to catastrophic failure. So why is this a hard problem? Why is this something that we've struggled with for so long? 
I would say at a high level, it's an area where our more principled or more theoretical or you know, uh, algorithmic control approaches tend to struggle. Right? More specifically, I would say that if we have a system that's nicely governed by an ODE, you know, x dot equals f of x u, and f is nice. Uh, it's continuous, it's differentiable, maybe it's smooth. Then in that regime, we have very good techniques uh, from you know, robotics and, and from control theory. Of course, when we start having contact, this all goes out the window fairly quickly. Uh, when we have uh, impact events, you have uh, discontinuities in the state as a function of time. Right? So you, uh, the velocity changes instantaneously or near instantaneously. You have discontinuities in the right half side, they're in the vector field. Uh, think, uh, for example, of friction, when the sign of your velocity changes and the sign of your force changes. You also lack continuity of solutions with respect to initial conditions. If you have a grazing impact, where the robot just barely makes contact with something in the environment or just barely misses it, well then tiny changes in initial conditions can lead to disproportionate changes uh, of the flow. At the end of the day, you know, contact is in, in essentially a binary phenomenon. Either the robot is touching something or it's not, and each of those lead to distinct outcomes. Of course, if we're in this you know, real world in a multi-contact setting, now we have a combinatorial number of such possibilities to consider, and that can quickly become intractable uh, for standard approaches. We also lack uniqueness in a lot of cases. And an example here I like is that of a four-legged table. If you take that four-legged table and you put it on the ground, it's statically indeterminate, as we know. We can't solve the forces in the legs, but at least we know it's not gonna go anywhere. If you take that same table and you slide it across the ground, now that static indeterminacy has become a dynamic indeterminacy. You can't predict where the table is going to go. There's a set of such possible solutions. And it's pretty natural when I, when I think of a, a speak about lack of uniqueness to say that's just a modeling phenomena uh, due to our rigid body model of the table and our rigid model of the interaction between the table and the ground. And that's definitely true. A more accurate model could resolve this lack of uniqueness. But what you find instead is an incredibly high stiffness, an incredibly high sensitivity to initial conditions. And up to our ability to perform state estimation, system identification, and the like, we might as well be treating this as a lack of uniqueness. We can't accurately predict where this table is going to go. You have additional things like xenophenomena. phenomena. You have a bouncing ball. Uh, it's going to bounce on the ground. It's eventually going to come to rest. And it's going to do so in finite time. But it's going to take an infinite number of impact events to get there. So the, you know, at the end of the day, our approaches and our models are going to have to be able to address these sorts of paradoxes and phenomena uh, if we're going to want them to produce useful results. So, you know, at a high level, my, my thesis has really all, been all about using optimization-based tools uh, to generate algorithms for control and planning uh, of this multi-contact dynamic motion. And this has led to, to work in a few different areas. I say broadly uh, grouped by uh, the first section where I'll talk about some trajectory optimization approaches, um, both a contact implicit approach where we don't know the order of contacts ahead of time, and also a, a, a constrained approach to produce higher accuracy motions. Uh, and then the second half of the talk, I'll focus on some more formal uh, computational approaches to design feedback policies uh, and to prove something about those policies, and particular prove stability, variance, and, and similar properties. Uh, I am going to spend the bulk of this talk on the, the sort of first and third bullet points here, but I'll touch on the other two as well. So I mentioned that I'll be uh, you know, using optimization and, and using some uh, models of contact throughout, and I'd like to justify that at least briefly. I would say really the promise of robotics is to produce uh, approaches where a robot's going to go out into the world, it's going to encounter a new task, perhaps a new environment, something it hasn't quite seen before, and then be able to des uh, design and execute a task, uh, so execute a policy to solve some task in that space. Uh, and, and the idea really is about reducing the need for experts to very carefully handcraft motions and to handcraft control policies. At the end of the day, if we can pose an optimization problem where I say, given a goal, get from point A to point B, uh, minimize some objective, maybe energy consumption along the way, all while satisfying some uh, environmental limitations or stability constraints, uh, then we do have one of these general purpose tools. Of course, you know, models are always imperfect, uh, and particularly uh, models of contact, it's something that's incredibly difficult to accurately capture. Uh, but they have been you know, pretty widely used and pretty effective in a lot of settings. They are for robotics challenges. Being one of them. So just to introduce some of the notation that I'll use throughout the talk, I'll have a state vector, which I'll call x, uh, and it'll be composed of joint coordinates q and velocity v. Typically v will just be q dot, but that doesn't necessarily have to be the case. And I'll have a gap function, phi, which will come up uh, pretty regularly. I think of phi as the distance from a, a point on the robot or a, a link on the robot to something in its environment. Whenever phi is positive, then we're not in contact. 
Whenever it's negative, then we have penetration, which is something I'll prohibit. And whenever phi is equal to zero, then we have sustained contact over some duration. Uh, I'm going to focus on rigid body uh, dynamics here, the standard rigid body equations. We have some mass matrix, some Coriolis terms, and uh, control input u. Uh, and these systems may often be underactuated, so we may have fewer uh, control inputs than degrees of freedom. Uh, and the contact forces I'll call lambda, which will be mapped through uh, Jacobi and J. Uh, I'm additionally going to focus on inelastic impulsive impacts, so impacts that occur instantaneously, with a post-impact condition that there be no bouncing. Okay? So they hit and stick. Uh, they may slide, but there's going to be no rebound in the normal direction. Uh, and finally, I'll, I'll take Coulomb friction as my model of friction, so standard dry friction here. Some of these assumptions are not really necessary for the approaches, but, but they provide us a nice starting place. Right, so, you know, one of the first questions I, I set out to answer uh, here at MIT was, you know, can we find efficient and effective motions in contact-rich settings? And uh, can we do so by specifying the simplest cost function, you know, some intuitive cost function like uh, energy consumption or mechanical work, rather than uh, getting into the business too much of balancing different objectives and, and fiddling with weights until they get the desired result. So this kind of brings up this idea of optimal control. I'm going to find some uh, state trajectory and some control input trajectory and minimize some cost, maybe an integrated cost along that trajectory, uh, such that the state and the input are dynamically consistent. So if I were to execute the input trajectory u, I would get the state trajectory as a result of my dynamics. Now, the challenge here is that you know, pretty much all approaches in, in this space rely on gradients. Right? You have to be able to take the derivative of your cost function, the derivative of your dynamics. And when we have contact, when we have impacts, we actually don't have these derivatives. There is a, a pretty standard approach in the community that's been widely used uh, for walking robots and other applications, and that's based on uh, a hybrid systems approach or hybrid optimization, where given some contact schedule known a priori, so given a mode sequence, where a mode is just a set of active contacts, the place of the robots in, in, in contact with the environment. So for a walking robot, we might have you know, a swing phase followed by heel strike, toe strike, and so on. If we can lay out this schedule ahead of time, uh, then we can basically use our standard approaches and, and go forward like that. And so this, this has been used uh, here at MIT, but really all around, around the world. Well, you know, that requires this contact schedule ahead of time. And, uh, you know, what if we don't have one? What if we can't specify this mode sequence? And a lot of this work was originally motivated by uh, a collaboration with IHNC in Florida where they were designing and building this fast runner robot. So this is a, you know, really a mechanically brilliant robot designed to run like, a, like an ostrich with only one actuator per leg. Uh, and it relies on a, a web of um, springs and tendons and other passive elements along with some internal hard stuff, so joint limits that are required to generate this motion. And, and we were posed with this question, you know, how do we design new motions for something like Fast Runner? If you look at this robot, it actually has dozens of potential contacts, so internal and external contacts. And if you take two to the dozens, you look at the combinatorics of this, now you have millions of potential modes to consider. And scheduling amongst those million modes is uh, impractical, it seems impossible, and, and really, we shouldn't have to do it. Somehow the algorithm should design the schedule for us. So I think it's important to take a step back and look at the, the realm of simulation, where computer simulators are incredibly fast now and are able to handle hundreds of thousands of contacts in real time. And the big idea behind this is that contacts are treated implicitly rather than explicitly. So there is no hidden state variable that, that's uh, sorting between these you know, millions or billions of possible modes in the simulation. Rather, the uh, state of the objects and the forces between them exist and are constrained via something called complementarity. So most simulators these days look a little bit like this. Uh, we're posing simulation as a search problem. We're going to look for a dynamically uh, consistent or dynamically feasible pairing of states and forces such that they satisfy a set of constraints. Things like non-penetration constraints, so phi has to be positive. The force has to be realistic, so it has to lie within the friction cone, the normal force being positive, for instance. And more importantly, we have this contact mode logic, which says whenever the gap function is positive, whenever we're not in contact, then the force necessarily has to be equal to zero. And you can rewrite that algebraically like this, where now we've taken that contact mode logic constraint and replaced it with this phi transpose lambda equal to zero, and you'll often see this written uh, succinctly using this perpendicularity notation. So going back to, to work originally in the 90s by Stuart and Trinkle and, and others, uh, a lot of simulators now essentially linearize these constraints and then solve them at every time step. So given a state of your, uh, your system, you linearize, you solve, and that gives you the state in your next time step, and you continue 
uh, onward like that. So the idea in our work here was to take some of these lessons learned from simulation and apply them in the realm of trajectory optimization. In particular, we're going to lift up the trajectory optimization problem and now search over states, control actions, and contact forces simultaneously, such that those forces must be constrained via these complementarity constraints. And this over-parameterization of the problem produces a bigger problem, uh, but it's one that simultaneously reasons over all possible contacts that might occur. So one way to think about that is you know, at intermediate stages, so pre-terminal stages of optimization, these constraints are going to be violated. So the robot might be exerting force on a nearby object. But we have this complementarity constraint, which says that's infeasible, but it gives graded information. So it says either that force that's going to have to disappear, it's going to have to go to zero, or you're going to have to come into contact. And in this way, we essentially provide gradients for this optimization problem about these seemingly discontinuous contact events. And now we have one program which uh, never has to explicitly reason about a particular mode schedule, but reasons over all possible contact forces. So mathematically, that looks a little bit like this, where we have a, you know, some cost function, maybe uh, energy consumption or mechanical work, and we have a set of constraints that enforce the manipulator equations, they enforce these complementarity constraints, so no force at a distance, and uh, also enforce Coulomb friction. So we can uh, generate motions like this. So given a simple tunic manipulator, we can say, uh, spin around that green ellipsoid and, and uh, uh, without giving it any information about the fact that it has to touch the green ellipsoid to move it or when or how often or where. Uh, but this sort of nat motion naturally emerges. We can generate walking gates for bipedal robots. But even more interestingly, we can find uh, gates now for the, something like the fashion robots. robot. So we can find periodic energy efficient running gates. Uh, and even more excitingly, we can find aperiodic motions, things like varying stride length by enforcing uh, in these gap constraints that the robot can run, or uh, going up and down steps at various heights. So, uh, I would say before, you know, as we were getting started in this project, we really had no idea how to generate motions for something like the fast running robot. And you know, I, I motivate this by saying we don't know the mode schedule. This is a big nonlinear program. So if anyone has worked with those, they're local searches, they require some guess to get started. And it's fair to ask, you know, given the guess that you started with, how different was the solution you've got? Was there a mode schedule buried inside that initial guess? And you know, we can answer that at least empirically by looking at fashion where we started with some initial guess shown in red and we get something out shown in blue and you know the takeaway is that they're quite different and with very little similarity. Now to make this plot I had to take those these 20 million some odd modes and compress them onto that y-axis to, to draw them. So one of the big limitations with this approach uh, lies in that Euler integration if you're paying, paying attention to the slides and that first order integration is not very accurate. And we also have to use relatively coarse time steps to produce a uh, computationally tractable problem. Um, so the sort of natural next question then is how do you refine that motion? Can you find a higher uh, order accuracy uh, trajectory that's going to uh, better enable you to execute this, this uh, motion in a real robot or in simulation? So, uh, suppose we know now a mode sequence, maybe coming from our contact implicit approach or just known ahead of time, uh, can we find a high accuracy trajectory that satisfies these contact constraints, which we'll call a manifold constraint. So we have some motion, we want it to satisfy phi equals to zero along some, uh, along some period. This is maybe the foot being on the ground is that constraint. Well, you know, often you can just use a coordinate change to get rid of this constraint so you don't have to think about it. So if we just have, say, a single support robot, we change our coordinates around, put the base of uh, uh, the robot at the foot, uh, and then just you know, throw out that constraint and can ignore it. But you know, that's not actually always possible. So if you have double support for your walking robot where both feet are on the ground, uh, well, you have this closed kinematic chain and you can't produce these globally minimal coordinates. So we really are going to have to think about that constraint. Uh, there's a lot of you know, work sort of in this area, particularly in walking robots, and I would say most of it is, is, is making a mistake in some place or another. Um, so the sort of things you could try is to enforce some sort of tangent uh, constraints. So you could train the dynamics, uh, phi to what equals to zero, and then integrate that. Maybe do that at some discrete set of points along your motion. Well, now you have integration error that's going to build up over your motion. You're going to have drift of your constraint. So this would correspond to the foot of the robot maybe coming off the ground or sliding along the ground. You could also try to just throw in some additional constraints. Say the trajectory has to stay on this manifold, right? The foot can't move. Uh, and this will actually lead to an over-constrained problem if you're not careful. So just to give the high-level idea of, of this work here is to take these constraints 
uh, enforce that the trajectory lie on the manifold, but then project down some of these constraints onto the manifold itself. And what this does is it results in a very clean, relatively simple extension of the classical direct collocation algorithm from Hargraves in Paris, where we can say a number of things. We say we don't ever drift away from the manifold, uh, we don't have an over-constrained problem, and we retain the cubic level integration accuracy from the original argument. So this is a very simple extension uh, of a widely used approach. And now we can produce things like walking and climbing and, uh, and high, highly dynamic motions, and then stabilize them because of that higher accuracy in simulation. So for the rest of this talk, I want to focus uh, more on these questions of uh, stability and reachability analysis. So can we design control policies that are going to be provably stable, and can we do so through contact with, under the influence of impacts and friction? Right? In particular, right now I want to focus on, you know, can we find simple control policies? Can I find state feedback policies, non-switching policies, uh, that are going to be provably stable in some region of state space around possible context. And I think this is an important question because anyone who's tried to implement uh, switching policies on a complicated system knows it can be incredibly difficult to identify, incredibly difficult to react to uh, the multitude of possible contexts that might occur. And I would say in some of these settings, uh, it's not really reasonable to ever explicitly plan for every eventuality. So, so hybrid analysis require a different policy for every mode combination, and that's not uh, going to scale tractably. So can I find, design and verify controllers that are going to stabilize contact? This notion of stability brings up the idea of Lyapunov functions. Uh, Lyapunov function to, to review captures the nonlinear, sorry, captures the stability properties of a nonlinear dynamical system. Uh, if we had a linear system, we could just look at the eigenvalues, for instance. So we can find such a function V, our Lyapunov function that maps from our state space to the positive reals such as everywhere positive and everywhere decreasing, then we have a certificate or a proof of stability. Uh, for a passive mechanical system, energy would fit this criteria. So in some way, this is a generalization of energy. Of course, we have robots. Uh, and it's not practical or reasonable to expect our robots to be globally stable. So instead, we're going to focus on regional analysis. So we can check these Lyapunov criteria everywhere on a sublevel set of V, everywhere that V is less than or equal to 1. Then we have a proof uh, of stability on that sublevel set. Now, even if we restrict ourselves to a relatively simple class of functions, say polynomials, uh, asking uh, these, these questions, v greater than zero, v dot less than zero, these are fundamentally questions of non-negativity, well, those questions for polynomials are still NP-hard. So fortunately, there's been a lot of really great work in this area, a lot of it done in this building uh, by, by Pablo and others. Uh, on replacing this question of global positivity with a, something that's clearly sufficient. So rather than saying some polynomial P is everywhere positive, say that it's equal to a sum of squares, the so sum of these A sub I squared, clearly that's sufficient. Uh, and you can rewrite that as a search for a positive semi-definite matrix Q that satisfies this equation. So P equals to M transpose QM, where M is just a basis of monomials picked ahead of time, say all of the monomials up to some degree. And if we can find this PST matrix, then we have a certificate that P is globally positive. And this is just a convex constraint in a semi-definite program. So finding such a Q is something we can do fairly efficiently as a generalization of linear and quadratic programming. So this approach has been really widely used, especially in recent years, to do things like find control policies, to prove stability, to find compute regions of attraction. Uh, and uh, a lot of that work has been done here, but also uh, all around the world. And the sort of thing you can do now is, and here's, here's an example, this is a time reverse Van der Poel oscillator, which has a periodic orbit shown in red, uh, and everything inside that red curve actually converges provably to the origin. And so using one of these sums of squares techniques, you can find the Lyapunov function and prove that at least everything in blue it, it will provably converge using the Lyapunov function. So it's finding an inner approximation of that true region of attraction. There's also been extensions of this idea to the realm of hybrid systems by Papa Krasnodolo and Prajna, where uh, you would generate a Lyapunov function for every hybrid mode, and you, and you check some criteria in every mode, and you check some criteria on transitions between modes. And so I want to think about a system, a, a relatively simple mechanical system with context. So this is a rimless wheel, a uh, pretty classical model used for uh, robotic walking. And I want to focus just on two legs now, the ones here shown in red, uh, where we now have two contact points between these feet and the ground. And these two contact points generate four modes, which correspond to you know, the left foot, the right foot, both feet, 
But we also have another six modes which correspond to sliding in either direction. So now we have 10 possible modes, and we have a number of transitions between these modes. And if you look at the literature, so the, the hybrid systems uh, version that uses sums of squares, it scales to uh, two or three modes, maybe, is sort of what you'll see in the papers. And so we're already pretty far beyond that, even for this uh, relatively simple example. So you know, how do we compute Lyapunov functions for impacts uh, for friction without this exponential, this combinatorial load enumeration problem? And to do that, I want to throw out the idea of ODEs as a governing uh, modeling framework and replace them with something called measure differential inclusions. So in MDI, uh, going back to the work by Jean-Jacques Moreau and his sweeping process, uh, allows us to write down a single set of equations which somehow govern all possible contact modes at the same time. So we have dv now for our velocities composed of two components. We have v dot, which governs the smooth uh, or continuous dynamics. And we have a jump term, v plus minus v minus, which corresponds to our impact events. And here d eta is just a sum of Dirac delta measures, which occur whenever we have an impact event. Okay. And so by allowing v dot and this jump term to be drawn from set value functions, that makes it this an inclusion rather than an equation. Uh, and it allows us to encompass things like uh, the lack of uniqueness in our systems of contact. And now we can rewrite our stability criteria in this language, where again, for our Lyapunov function, we have dv being composed of two components, a continuous component and a jump term. And so our stability criteria now is just going to be able to check dv less than or equal to zero for all possible scenarios, for all possible impacts, for all frictional forces, and all continuous evolutions. If we can assert that this holds, then we have our proof of stability. So I want to uh, at least take a step back for a moment and, and talk about what it means to resolve an impact event. That's going to lead to our criteria here. So this is a, originally a graphical model going back to the 1800s and John Rao, where uh, we continuously increment our impulsive force uh, throughout an impact event while simultaneously satisfying our Coulomb friction uh, uh, criteria. So looking at our velocity, uh, in the contact plane. We have an, on the y-axis, this is our penetrating velocity into the surface, and on the x-axis is the sliding velocity. We can think about this as describing a path through velocity space. So we start with our pre-impact velocity here, uh, and we can visualize the effects of the Coulomb friction cone. So anything inside these two rays corresponds to a, a feasible force uh, from Coulomb friction. Of course, we're sliding to the left, right? We're over here, and so we have to follow one of these two extreme rays, and we do that. We follow that along until it hits the y-axis, and the y-axis corresponds to sticking, where the tangential velocity is zero. And because we can sustain sticking for this example, we follow that down uh, until we terminate here at our post-impact velocity. So what we're going to do now to check our stability criteria is just to check that v decreases along such paths. Okay? And clearly, that will imply that v decreases over the, the uh, duration of an impact event. Now, this is originally a model for two dimensions and for single context. So we might have three dimensions. We might have uh, multiple simultaneous contacts. And if you have simultaneous contacts, this is a regime that's incredibly hard to model, incredibly hard to predict. You sort of have to make this decision as to which contact, which impact do you resolve first. Maybe if you have a pool break event, for instance, we're playing a game of billiards. Well, in this area, we're interested in checking stability. So I'm going to take an incredibly permissive view of what it means to be a simultaneous impact. So a simultaneous impact here is going to be resolved by a whole set of possible paths, which correspond to all possible orderings of your impact events. And along the set of such paths, we're going to enforce this uh, dv less than equal to zero criteria. Okay. So you know, how do we actually check this? Um, you know, dv, you know, I haven't really said what that is or, or written out an equation for it. And if we think about it as a function of state, well, it still has this combinatorial structure. That hasn't gone anywhere. It's just been buried into this uh, confusing looking term. But instead, if we think about it as a function of state and force together, where the force could, could mean here uh, continuous forces or uh, impulsive forces you know, with direct measures, well, this is a nice equation, something we can write down pretty easily just from our manipulator equations. And now, the trick is to only check this whenever our state and force pairing is admissible, whenever it's dynamically realistic. So you have to constrain this set uh, to be physically realistic. And the sort of beauty of it is that's actually really easy to do. 
Uh, we can write down that set as a semi-algebraic set, something described by polynomial equations and inequalities, using uh, a bunch of terms which look a little bit like those complementarity equations from before. So we have things like non-penetration, we have dissipation inequalities here, we have uh, this constraint for no force and distance, we have Coulomb friction, and taken all together, we now have a semi-algebraic set, and we just have to check a simple polynomial inequality on that set. And that's something that's actually you know, really natural to do uh, with the language of sums of the square. So using uh, something called the S procedure, which derives from uh, the positive Schoen sets, you know, asking if a polynomial is not negative on a semi-algebraic set is a very natural question. Okay, so what can we do with that? We can go back to that Rimmus wheel example before and, and take a look uh, at it. So as simple as this example seems, it has a, a number of interesting properties. One is it actually does exhibit Zeno phenomena. So as this Rimmus wheel comes to rest, it rocks back and forth, and it does so an infinite number of times uh, before settling. It also exhibits lack of unique solutions. If you take the Rimmus wheel and you take it high up in the air and you drop it straight down, uh, where both feet land simultaneously, you now have this simultaneous impact question. And depending on how you resolve that, it can either stick or it can roll to one direction or the other. This is uh, similar in a sense to taking a thin block of wood up in the air and trying to drop it straight down. You're not going to be able to predict which way it bounces. So for this example now, we can look at the equilibrium shown down here in red. So this is a 2D slice of our 5D state space. And we can ask the question, you know, what region of state space around that equilibrium can we verify? Can we check this uh, Lyapunov criteria on? And that's the region shown here in blue. So everything in red corresponds to the inadmissible set, so one or both legs penetrating the ground. Up at the top here is the unstable equilibrium, so everything outside of that is going to roll to one side or the other. And what we can verify now is a practically useful, a significant portion of state space around that equilibrium. It's not the true region of attraction. Okay? This is just an inner approximation. The true region of attraction, in this case, is unbounded and disconnected. But I would argue that you know, it is a nice, you know, uh, practically useful set if we were to use this sort of thing for planning or control design. We could take a look at other examples as well. So this is one uh, based off some earlier work done by Alexei Despians and Mark Tchaikovsky at Stanford, uh, with later follow-on work by Elena Glassman and Ross and others. Uh, here and at Stanford, where we have a perching glider that's uh, uh, perching on the wall, and there's a set of states that we know are uh, unsafe. So maybe they correspond, in this case, to uh, exceeding force limits uh, at certain parts of the glider. And we can say, what are the set of states which will provably never reach those unsafe regions, despite possible impacts and frictional forces? And that, here again, here is shown in blue with the inadmissible region shown in red. Now, earlier I mentioned that uh, energy was a Lyapunov function for passive mechanical systems. Turns out when it's perching, this thing is a passive mechanical system. And so are we just finding energy back again? Are we finding this trivial solution? Um, and luckily, it turns out the answer is no. So energy here is shown in green. That's a level set of energy. Uh, and we're finding something different. And we're finding something, at least by our metric here, that's capturing a larger volume of states. So we're not just finding that trivial solution. More interestingly, we can start to ask questions about control synthesis. So this is a, an example uh, similar to the Rimmus wheel where I've added an additional degree of freedom and added uh, an actuator and said, can we find a feedback policy, a cubic state feedback control policy through contact that's going to be provably stable? And can we do so in a way that maximizes the region that we can verify? This is a harder question for, for anyone who's thought about it. And the easiest way to see that is that our V dot expression has a component from our Lyapunov function and our component from our control uh, policy u. And so it's bilinear. And in this case, we're going to use a bilinear uh, alternation approach where we fix one of these. So fix uh, the controller, find the Lyapunov function, and then alternate, fixing the Lyapunov function, finding the controller, and repeating until convergence. Uh, so it is a local method. Um, but we are able to find uh, this region shown in blue. Uh, that again captures a nice volume of state space around these possible contact events. Uh, these tools, so sums of squares and the app and the function, these all produce uh, the potential to be overly conservative. Uh, we're finding again an inner approximation. So it's important to ask, you know, how conservative are we being? And that's impossible to answer in generality, right? We have a seven dimensional state space. If we can answer that question, we would you know, not need any of these techniques. So this is a 2D slice of that state space, so just sampled and simulated. We can uh, check this question, at least in slices, where everything that's stable is shown here in red as a red dot, 
and the region we're verifying is shown in blue. So again, it's not the entire RLA, but it is, I would say, capturing a nice, um, a nice volume of state space. It, it nicely captures at least some of the structure, some of the shape of the RLA, but it's still, it is conservative. Most importantly, uh, we can do this in a tractable, relatively tractable manner. And um, so we can prove a couple of things. One is we can eliminate the effect of unbounded force variables. So I said lambda earlier was gonna be the uh, continuous forces and the impulsive forces. And handling those impulsive forces in, in the same way is actually uh, numerically bad. But we turns out we can eliminate those and, and don't have to deal with them. But most importantly, uh, we can think about the effects of contacts uh, individually rather than in combinations. And this is what's gonna allow us to scale, uh, scale more attractively. So at the end of the day, we can write down a sum to squares problem that scales quadratically, this is the size of the SLS problem, scales quadratically in the number of contacts, whereas a hybrid system formulation is doomed from the very, very beginning to scale exponentially. And so for the last uh, part of this talk in, in the time remaining, uh, I wanna uh, talk a little bit about some of our more recent work here uh, on bipedal balancing and step recovery. Uh, so, you know, these formal tools like sum of squares uh, and similar approaches are fantastic, but they're limited to relatively low dimensional systems. Uh, and they don't yet scale to something like our humanoid robots or Valkyrie robot or Atlas robot, what have you. But at the same time, you know, low dimensional, relatively simple models have been widely used and been incredibly effective in the realm of uh, humanoid and bipedal locomotion. So a lot of these models have uh, the flavor of something like this, where you have a center of mass or a centroidal type model, maybe with an inverted pendulum to model the legs, or maybe it has a spring, maybe it doesn't. Uh, but they're all uh, you know, in this similar line. Um, and there's been a lot of great work using those approaches, uh, going back to like, the ASIMO robot, uh, the Darpa Robotics Challenge, why we use these models, uh, and, and some great work done at IHMC by, by Tuan and others. Um, and, you know, you can think of these as simple models and maybe as uh, you know, modeling assumptions, but I would say more accurately, they're restrictions on the possible controllers. So to take a simple model and embed it in a high dimensional plant like uh, Valkyrie or like Atlas, you have to you know, use your control authority to make your robot look like one of these simple models. But the big advantage here is that uh, they enable real, you know, really simple, uh, often closed form computations. You can result in like, you know, one dimensional, two dimensional models, things with linear dynamics, things where you can actually compute the best controller, compute the region of attraction, uh, you know, pen with pencil and paper, essentially. Right. I would say, you know, that this is, there's really a, a sort of low hanging fruit, this is a sweet spot to use some of these more formal tools like sum to squares to explore the middle ground between these simple models and between, you know, your 30 dimensional uh, humanoid robot like Atlas. And that, I think it's something where our tools like Sender Squares will scale uh, and, and enable us to, to perform analysis in that space. So uh, the linear inverted pendulum model is one of these classical models that has been widely used and was the basis for, for instance, of the Dark Robotics Challenge, uh, originally going back to, to work by Kajita and others in the 90s. Um, and it makes a number of assumptions. Uh, so one, it assumes that the center of mass height it moves in a planar in, in a plane, and often that actually just means the center mass height is going to be constant. It also implies that the angular momentum is going to be constant, and going along with that is this, the lack of an impact model. So if you want the center of mass height to remain constant, then you can't have an impact force. Uh, this model all additionally makes some assumptions on the swing log dynamics, essentially by enforcing a minimum step time and a maximum step distance. So. In our work here, we took aim at a number of these different assumptions and tried to analyze their effects more formally. So by first looking at models that uh, allow the center mass height to vary, uh, and models that allow angular momentum to vary, and also models where we permit uh, impact forces, potentially as a stabilizing effect, right? So an impact is gonna uh, uh, be a dissipative effect to reduce the energy of the system that could have a notable stabilizing effect. And one of the questions we answered really is, uh, asked is, how do these simplifications, so things like constant height, constant angular momentum, how much do they matter when it comes to balancing and fall prevention? Uh, do, these, you know, do these simple models give too much away uh, in the aim of producing simple controllers? Or by including them as control options, uh, could we greatly improve the balancing capabilities of our robots? So I just want to give uh, 
the, the highlight of the results here um, in, in the interest of time. So exact computation of these region of traction, of course, is going to be intractable for our high dimensional systems or even our, our moderate dimensional systems. So instead, we're going to use some of the squares techniques to compute both inner and outer approximation. So an inner approximation of these balancing regions or these regions of attraction uh, will be done via Lyapunov functions, like previously. And it turns out you can actually use a, a similar uh, related SOS technique uh, to produce outer approximations as well. So the sort of things we can do with this tool now are, are answer that question from before. How much does uh, it matter if we allow the center mass height to go up and down? How much does it matter if we permit angular momentum as a balancing strategy rather than just relying uh, on center pressure or ankle torques for our, our robot? So shown here on the left is, is the inner approximation coming again from these Lyapunov functions, where the classical LIPM is this region shown in blue. So this is a this is state space now where we're looking at phase space. We're looking at the uh, position and velocity of our center of mass. And everything that the standard model can, can balance from is shown here in blue. Uh, and this is something you can compute in closed form with pencil and paper. Now, shown here in red, which you probably can't see, is the region you would get if you allow height to go up and down. And you can see that it's, it's marginal almost not even noticeable. But shown in green is a set of states we can balance from uh, if we allow height and angular momentum to be used as balancing strategies. So this would correspond maybe to using your arms, for instance, or you, you know, pitching your torso back and forth to balance, rather than just relying upon your ankle. And what you see is that that is noticeable. It's not a huge effect, certainly, but it is a noticeable effect. and certainly more uh, valuable than just allowing height to go up. On the right, we have outer approximation. So this allows us to, uh, gives us a metric for, for our, how conservative we're being. We know certainly that no states outside of here can be balanced, right? If you're out there, then you're gonna need to step or you're gonna fall. Uh, certainly you can't recover by any balancing technique. And it provides a, a measure of tightness. So the, blue, the blues in these two slides are, are identical. Uh, and it says that, okay, so maybe there's some set of states out here in the red, which height could be used to balance them. We can't prove that we can, that it will be effective, but it might exist. But even still, it's not going to be that significant. We can perform similar computations as well to allow stepping. So we know that balancing is nice, but if you actually get shoved too hard, you're going to have to step to prevent falling. And you can perform, again, you know, using a recursive or iterative approach, you can compute these same regions uh, in, to, to include stepping as well. A similar side effect here is that if we know we're outside these regions, then we you know, should be bracing for impact. If we know we're going to fall, uh, then you know prepare prepare for that fall. To occur. So just to, to briefly recap, you know I think that by very carefully you know considering the mechanics of contact and considering how that fits into our uh, optimization tools, both convex and non-convex optimization, we can really start to tackle some of these fundamentally difficult questions in the field. So I talked a bit about a number of different approaches for, for planning and control, uh, starting with the contact implicit trajectory optimization approach, where we eliminate the need for an a priori scheduling of these contact events. And then later, how do we refine such motions? How do we get higher accuracy motions that enable us to actually execute them and stabilize them? Uh, and then I talked uh, again about some of these formal techniques for computing Lyapunov functions and computing feedback policies through contact, uh, where we can uh, prove stability, we can prove uh, you know, regions of attraction. And then how you might apply some of these formal tools uh, to actual robots. So how do you get uh, you know, a, a sum to squares based controller onto your humanoid robot, onto your full dimensional robot? And I think uh, these extensions of civil models is a nice place for that. Uh, of course, there are certainly are, are some limitations that, that come here. I've talked, you know, motivated a lot of this talk by you know, thinking about uh, unexpected or unplanned contact, and I really haven't talked at all about explicit notions of robustness or uncertainty, and that's you know definitely uh, an important but very difficult question to incorporate things like stochastic uncertainty or uh, bounded parametric uh, uncertainty into our models. You can incorporate some of these, you know, bounded uncertainty into your, into your sum of squares tool, for instance, uh, although it does come at, at computational cost. So I think there's a lot of it, uh, exciting uh, uh, work still to be done there. Uh, these tools that I've talked about today are all offline tools, so uh, computations that take uh, anywhere from a handful of seconds to uh, a few hours to, to run. And um, you know, at the end of the day, we're going to need to be able to address 
uh, these sorts of questions in real time. So a robot's gonna have to encounter a new environment uh, that maybe is not something it, it pre-computed and then design a control policy uh, that's robust to contact, that handles new contacts, but also a controller that's gonna be able to leverage new contacts or reach out and brace against the wall to prevent falling, for instance. And lastly, I focused you know, entirely on these rigid contacts, so, uh, where contact is gonna occur at a point between two rigid bodies. Uh, there's you know, a lot of evidence that uh, suggests that softer material, soft contact, particularly at the interface between the robot and its environment, has a, a stabilizing effect um, and you know, that certainly seems to be the direction that the field is moving. Of course, these soft contacts and soft interfaces are very difficult to model accurately. So something typically uh, modeled using you know, partial differential equations, and it's not something that's gonna become computationally tractable, particularly in real time. Uh, I would say you know, there's uh, an opportunity to use some of these simple models uh, that are going to be inaccurate when it comes to surface surface you know contact with a, a variable pressure distribution uh, in combination with some of the sophisticated tactile sensors that allow us to measure that pressure distribution in real time uh, and by combining a simple model with sophisticated sensors and the right amount of feedback uh, we can produce controllers for these softer softer interfaces um, as, as Russ, Russ mentioned all, you know all this thesis has essentially been in you know, theoretical and in simulation. Uh, I'm very excited about uh, getting some robots into the lab. So as I'm thinking about, you know, building, building a lab going forward, uh, I hope if you come by sometime, you know, in the future, you'll see a Cassie robot running around or maybe a robotic arm like a Frank Amico or a, or a KUKA arm uh, doing some, some exciting work and uh, hopefully I'll, I'll see you there. Um, I'd like to conclude by thanking, uh, thanking everyone. So. You know, this thesis has not been just me. Uh, there's a whole MIT and broader community that's gone into this. Uh, Russ sort of, sort of mentioned it earlier, but I came to MIT to work with Russ. That was the reason uh, that I'm here now. Uh, and that's been a great decision, so I'll pat myself in the back for that. Um, <laughs> you know, the, the support, the mentorship, uh, the advice that I've gotten over the last uh, six years has been incredible. Uh, and, you know, I think building a lab like the Robot Locomotion Group is something to, to aspire to. I'd like to thank my uh, committee members as well. So uh, Tomas Susano Perez is here and uh, Sertash Perman and Andy Rina who are remote uh, for, for all of their help, their sort of advice, the questions that they've asked and, and uh, probing insightful questions, uh, especially Andy for ne never being satisfied with an explanation that's uh, in, any, in any way deficient. That's forced, you know, these sort of questions have really forced me to think through these ideas uh, and to better be able to explain them. Um, I'd like to thank the, the people I've collaborated with. Uh, so uh, you know, I worked with Mark on some of these techniques using some of the squares, uh, with, with Scott and some of the uh, trajectory optimization, uh, particularly the constrained trajectory optimization, uh, and then with Tuan more recently on, on the work on bipedal balancing. And, and you know, these sorts of collaborations are uh, one of the reasons that you know, MIT and the Robot Locomotion Group has been such a fantastic place to be. You know, all the, the uh, you know, the chats at the whiteboard, getting coffee, you know, the, the group is such an incredibly collaborative, such an incredibly uh, individually brilliant and collaboratively brilliant place to be. Uh, and that's thanks to all, all the, the people uh, who've been here. You know, I, I would probably especially call out uh, both Frank and, and Ani, who I came here to MIT with and, and have spent, you know, uh, the bulk of this six, six years sitting next to and, and uh, rehashing the same trite conversations over and over again, and it's been, it's been so much fun. Uh, and, and so thank you both for, for that. Uh, I've made some great friends, many of whom are here in the audience uh, and, and who I you know, lived with and, and still hang out with and, and will plan to be spending time with it for years and years to come. Uh, my family has been so supportive. My mom and dad are here, so thank you, uh, and along with a number of, of family friends for you know, putting up with me for a long time can be a lot, I'm sure. Uh, and the last but not least, Molly. Um, I don't want to embarrass you too much, Molly, but uh, you know, this last four and a half years, so most of the pieces have been, have been spent with you, uh, and I couldn't ask for anything more than that. And with that, I'll take any, any questions.
for, for questions from the audience. Uh, after that, we'll ask just the faculty to stay and, and ask even more questions. Uh, and then, assuming that goes well, well, actually, we'll, we'll celebrate it either way. Uh, <laughs> but everybody's invited to join us for a celebration down in the in that space that he's got on the, on the fixture there, 32380, uh, for an after party. So, fire away. Um, so, thank you for the great talk. It was really great. Um, I'm wondering, a lot of the results that you've shown were mostly in 2D, for example, the running uh, mm -hmm. examples. How do you think um, your approaches would be extended to 3D? Because then you have to deal with this notion of probably linearization of the friction cone or. So, that's a good question. Michael, yeah. Well, can, you, can, can you repeat that every question? Yeah. So, Neem was asking, you know, how do you extend this to 3D? Uh, and, and particular thinking about linearization of the friction cone. Um, so the, the friction, you know, just so the friction cone obviously can be linearized in three dimensions to arbitrary accuracy. Um, it's not required actually for, for the approaches I talked about today. You can act, treat the entire friction cone um, as it stands uh, in its, you know, nonlinear form. The, um, and, and the reason essentially for that is that these approaches don't rely on linearizations in, a, in any particular case. And so you can encode uh, stability criteria, for instance, for three dimensions. You can encode uh, your trajectory compensation with the original friction cone. You know, the big challenge, I would say, with 3D is that it's more computationally intensive. You have to add a number of degrees of freedom to represent you know, your 60 uh, you know, position and orientation of your floating base. Um, and you're, you, know, you have to add uh, second uh, axis for your tangential forces. So it, you know, computationally, it scales up significantly, but theoretically, there's no, there's no uh, real change needed. Okay. So I've always been interested in angular momentum. I like that example you showed at the end. Um, so um, to what extent can you put in constraints on angular momentum that can be generated as, as a function of state? So for example, if the torso is already bent, you can't bend further. Mm -hmm. and, uh, more generally, uh, a lot of times the angular momentum is a function of what arms are doing. So to what extent is this, you know, how complicated So the, the question is, um, you know, as far as using angular momentum to balance, how can you encode constraints on angular momentum and you know, things like torso pitch? And also, can you include constraints that relate to the positions of your arms in, in doing so? Um, in the work here, there are bounds on this reaction wheel style model that was used here. So there's a bound on the pitch, essentially, of the reaction wheel. There's a bound on the torque you can use to generate that pitch. So you can't go too far forward or backwards. Uh, so you can include that at, at a basic level. Uh, the challenge becomes in uh, relating those bounds to the actual state of your robot. And because this is, a, a, is a, uh, intentionally a low-dimensional simple model, your bounds have to be written in terms of that low-dimensional state. Um, so you have to sort of generate a one-size-fits-all bound on, on pitch and angular momentum that may or may not be uh, representative of your true robot. Uh, in the stability analysis when you designed the controller, the controller wasn't dependent on the actual contact mode. Right. So if you wanted to use this for something like a Cassie robot, you might not want to be sensitive to the specific contact mode of like, is my heel touching or my toe touching for that specific foot, but you do care if you're on your left foot versus your right foot. So how would you extend the techniques to deal with so, that so sort the, of situation? So the question is, you know, can you extend some of these uh, control design and stability analysis techniques to systems where you might have some context that you want to be indifferent to, but some other uh, modes, like a left-right uh, mode, where you really want to be dependent on that, on that mode. And uh, the answer is you definitely could. So I mean, you, you could combine this sort of thing with a hybrid systems approach, where maybe you have two hybrid modes, left and right, and then you're going to design you know, a, a more uh, contact agnostic control policy within those different modes that governs things like toe heel contact. So definitely that could be extended. So the question is, you know, how do you 
I mean, it's more broadly, how would you compare this to what uh, Emil Todorov and, and, and some of his students have done, uh, where they're able to generate you know, really interesting motions at, at uh, higher computational rates. Um, you know, certainly there's a different, I would say at a very high level, if you look up, say, the trajectory, op trajectory optimization, excuse me, approach um, here versus some of the, the similar work they had done, you, we basically converge on the same problem uh, and then here we're solving that problem using nonlinear programming, and, and Mo and, and some of the students like Igor took that problem and simplified it in a number of ways to make it more computationally tractable. Um, you know, I, I think it remains to be seen, you know, what level of accuracy is needed to, to actually execute this sort of uh, these dynamic motions on a real robot. And there's a number of roadblocks in the way to get there, and that would be one way to, to judge it. Um, in terms of the complexity. You know, some of these complementary constraints are pretty nasty when it comes to embedding them into optimization problems. They uh, remove, you, know, you don't actually satisfy a number of regularity conditions uh, that you would like to have for your optimization. You don't have a feasible interior, and that can get a, a little nasty. Um, you know, I don't, I would say, bigger picture, I don't know what the right answer way is to get high accurate contact implicit approaches at, at real time rates. I think that's uh, an incredibly hard question that, that uh, maybe someone in the, will, will figure out. Maybe not. <laughs> yeah. How do you evaluate the penetration function? Is it a Genovon search or is it like uh, using a level set function representation of the services you have and then just uh, one time evaluation of the level set and then? So the question is, how do you evaluate the, the gap function phi? Right? Um, most of these examples are relatively simple, things like where you can compute that in closed form. Uh, so you know, a point to plane, a surface, a, you know, sphere to plane sort of contact. Um, in the cases where that wasn't, uh, so maybe I'll take a step back. For the Lyapunov, well, the second half of the work, you need to put right down a, a polynomial uh, function that, that, that represents phi. So you have to use like Taylor approximation, for instance, uh, if you didn't have it naturally as a polynomial. Um, on the trajectory optimization side, you know, you're a little, it's a little more, more broadly defined. Um, you know, I, again, most of the examples are relatively simple. There was an ellipsoid, ellipsoid contact where I you know, just had a, a, an algorithm to, to generate that, that function and take its derivative. Um, but you know, as long as you can compute phi and compute its gradient uh, using whatever algorithm you like, you'll, you'll be all right. Um, the gradient, if you're going to use something that's iterative, like GJK, is, is can be tricky uh, because you may not get a good gradient out of that. Uh, but if you can get a gradient, maybe. Okay. Thank you all. Maybe we'll, we'll I have a question. Next week. You want to ask now, or do you want to ask during the uh, faculty-only session? Maybe? It's, it's a general question. Okay. Is that, uh, somebody else was talking about. It. I don't know. If, no, Russ was just concluding, so go ahead. Um, okay, so first is, I just sit back to the Torov question. Generally speaking, he's doing trajectory optimization, and generally speaking, you're doing policy optimization. So you're, it's sort of the, so the rule of thumb would be is that you're doing a worse job on a broader problem. Is that, is that a correct statement? Uh, kind of. I mean, the first part of the talk was trajectory optimization. So uh, I would say doing a worse job on a, more accurate problem, if that makes sense. The broader problem, bigger problem. Sure, yeah. Yeah, and then the second thing is in, that, in the policy optimization, have you done a problem that somebody else has done a different way, or have you done a problem a different way, where instead of doing, you know, you're provably a convergence sum of squares and convex estimate, convex center bounds and so on, you just did uh, something more brute force that maybe not provably accurate, but um, you know, pro, 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 uh, parameterizing a control and then just uh, doing some kind of Monte Carlo estimates for the basin attraction. Or in the, in the extreme case, you, know, you, you compared your basis of attraction to so-called exact ones, which presumably are numerical ones also. So have you done like this comparison of, of a computation time and accuracy of what you're doing to other things that people might naturally do. Um, no, but that's a, that's, a, that's a good idea. So uh, for instance, we could, 
it's a slightly different model we use, but we could start thinking about how to compare some of the you know, bipedal balancing results with, with the work that um, uh, you did with Peter. Um, that'd be one idea. I, I, you know, unfortunately, there aren't a lot of things to compare against in this space. Um, so I don't, I don't know if you have something in mind, um, but that would be. Well, let's, let's just take, take, take Fast Runner, yeah. where you, where you cooked up uh, some kind of policy, mm -hmm. uh, but you could imagine somebody would just say, make, uh, make a ten parameter controller, and just do a, a genetic algorithms or something like that, and just test them again and again, and, and try and converge on some, on some. Uh, stable controller, and then try to try as best could to maximize the base of attraction, and then get some rest of the estimate of base of attraction for some sort of uh, somewhat Monte Carlo derived controller. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you could. You could. I mean, it's not something I've done, um, but I think it'd be interesting to try something like a, a genetic algorithm or you know stochastic uh, gradient descent. Uh, for did, Jerry, did Jerry try something on his own without you for the fa for fast runner? Not to my knowledge. I see. Okay. And their focus there was on getting it to to run, um, you know, using uh, basically the passive dynamics and a very simple control of the sinusoidal motion. Um, mm -hmm. The you talk more about how that project went at the end of the day, but that uh, that the full scale fast runner never ran. Uh, that they now have some smaller fast runners uh, that, are, that are getting there. Okay, but how about just take their passive system and estimate the basin of attraction for it, which you, which you have your way so I, I mean, I can't estimate a basin of attraction for anything that complicated, right? The, the basin of attraction uh, code is, is, you know, really limited to a handful of degrees of freedom, uh, not something on the order of fast runner. Um, you could, and, and I don't know how you'd even start there. Even something sampling based is never going to sample under the 30 degrees of freedom to get you you know, a real certificate. No, without a certificate. Yeah, you could yeah. look. You could look in you know certain directions, for instance, uh, and maybe uh, try to compute things that way. But I think we should go to the faculty session. Yeah, Andy, why don't we pause there and uh, let people leave, and uh, we'll, we'll pick it back up in a few minutes. Thanks again, everybody. We'll see you down in 380. Celebrate with us.